Hello and welcome to today's webinar where we will be exploring why physical activity in schools is so important. I'm Hannah Stoughton, CEO of Governors for Schools, and this term as part of our Wellbeing Governors campaign, we're moving our focus to how keeping active can improve both the mental health and well-being of pupils and also has an impact on behaviour and academic achievement. We're keen to share how, through having a better understanding of what this might look like, governors can support schools in this area. So we've got four speakers joining us today to share their expertise. Um, so I'll go through and, and welcome them individually. We have actually got Chris is delayed slightly, but hopefully will be joining us bef um, before the end of the webinar to share his experience. So first of all, we have Bert Bond. Bert is a researcher in the Children's Health and Exercise Research Centre, which is an internationally recognised paediatric research unit at University of Exeter. His research interests include how exposure, exposure to certain lifestyle risk factors alter your cardiometabolic health. Then we have Alex Ogden. Uh, Alex, Og, Alex is a former primary school teacher. He's an education consultant and now the education PE and school sport lead for Yorkshire Sport Foundation. Uh, Yorkshire Sport Foundation is part of the wider active partnership <coughs> you may have heard of. Um, they're a Sport England and lottery funded charity supporting organisations across South and West Yorkshire. Uh, after Alex, we'll hear from John Smedley. John is a former teacher and deputy head. He is an educational consultant, researcher and writer who specialises in the benefits of physical activity and active learning. John is the founder and director of Teach Active, which is a tool that provides teachers with lesson plans and resources on how to deliver their maths and English curriculum through physical activity. Finally, we'll hear from Chris Tolson. Chris is the head teacher of the Academy at St James in Bradford, which is the AAP School Sport and Physical Activity Centre of Excellence. Um, the school was also recognised as the winner of the Yorkshire PE and Sport Premium Award for the most active school in West Yorkshire. As I said, Chris has been slightly delayed with um, dealing with school, school issues, but I hope he will, will join us shortly. Uh, I'm going to hand over to each, each panellist in turn to, to speak. Um, they will be sharing slides, which we will then share following the webinar via email, and we'll also be sending out a recording of the webinar so that you can watch it back. So without further ado, I'm going to pass over to you, Bert. Thanks, uh, thanks, Hannah. I just share my screen now. And Ollie, can you confirm that you can see my slides in presenter mode? Yep, we can. Excellent, that's great. I'm glad you can, because I can't. There we go, okay. Um, so yes, afternoon everyone, and, and thanks very much, uh, Hannah and, and Matt, and also Ollie for, for putting this on. You know, really pleased to be here. Um, I'm going to be talking about some of the evidence we have behind the links between physical activity um, and cardiovascular health. Um, but we're really, I'm going to be sort of digging down into just that a little bit because I know that Becky Chalton, who's also a researcher from the Children's Health and Exercise Research Centre, is contributing to next week's webinar. So it's going to be a bit of a theme between myself and Becky and, and the work that we're doing. Uh, with regards to the role that schools can play. So I'm going to be as, try and be as thought provoking as possible. Please do put your questions into the chat um, and come along to next week as well, where we'll be discussing it a little bit further. OK, so I just thought I'd start with a, a bold statement, and that is that even in COVID times, diseases which we give ourselves, so non-communicable diseases, not infectious diseases, are killing us more than anything else. OK. So cardiovascular diseases, so CBD, kills 18 million people every single year. And if you're wondering what 18 million people look like, that's every single person you've ever known and loved in Cornwall, in Devon, in where are we now? I think that's Somerset, Dorset, uh, Gloucestershire, Wiltshire, and everyone in Wales, and everyone in Scotland and Northern Ireland, and everyone in Ireland. That's what 18 million people look like every single year. Now, closer to home in the UK, um, cardiovascular diseases also kill the same number of people as cancer. Okay, and 50,000 of those deaths per year in the UK are considered to be early mortality, so dying before the age of 75. And the important point here is that perhaps 80% of these cases are preventable. 
So 80% of early mortality is preventable. Now, what does this have to do with working with children and young people? Well, that's really what I want to talk about today. So on the screen in front of you, uh, you should be able to see a slide. I might be able to change my mouse to a, to a laser pen here so you can see. On our y-axis, we've got um, the percentage of children and adolescents under autopsy. So they, they were perfectly healthy, but they had died perhaps from a road traffic incident, for example. But they were perfectly healthy. And under autopsy, researchers had looked at their fatty streaks in their arteries. OK, so this is the percentage of young people that have fatty streaks in their arteries. Um, and this is their age. And what you can see is that even in early life, we have fatty streaks in their arteries. So in primary school, maybe 35% of your pupils will have fatty streaks in the arteries around the heart. If you teach key stage three, 75% of those kids will have fatty streaks in their coronary arteries. And so this process that leads to cardiovascular disease later on in life, so heart attacks and strokes, has already started in every single one of us on the call. It starts early. OK, let's explore that a little bit further. This is more autopsy data in children and young adolescents. And here on our y-axis, what I'm going to show you is this isn't this is a different y-axis. It's not the number of children that have fatty streaks. It's the amount of the blood vessel that's covered by fat. OK, and we're going to look at the aorta, which is the, the large artery sort of leaving the heart and the coronary arteries. And these are the ones that get blocked with um, fatty streaks and cause a heart attack, uh, coronary artery disease. OK. And what you can see is that there is a direct proportion between the number of risk factors that you have when you're growing up for cardiovascular disease, which might be obesity is one of them, smoking is another one, high blood pressure is all these things we know to be bad, they're cardiovascular disease risk factors. The more risk factors you have, the greater the amount of fat there is in your artery when you are a child or a teenager. OK, so in other words, what we're saying here is how you live as a child directly affects the health of your blood vessels. But the question that we really want to try and understand is, well, no child is getting a heart attack, but they do when they're an adult. And I want to understand that link. And what's quite exciting, I suppose, about being a pediatric physiologist is that we now have this evidence available. We have this longitudinal evidence. We've been tracking children since the 70s who've now grown up and we can take a look at their risk for cardiovascular disease and attribute it to how they lived when they were very young. OK, so let's take a look at that. Here we've got a thousand teenagers. And what what these researchers did is they gave them a score based on all these cardiovascular disease risk factors. So BMI stands for body mass index. That's a measure of overweight or obesity. So they gave them a score for their weight status, how active they were, what their diet was like, if they smoked and so on and so forth. And they did that when they were teenagers. And then 21 years later, they got them back in the lab to see how healthy they were. OK, so this longitudinal evidence. Now, what they did is this, this team of researchers split those teenagers up into six groups, group one through to group six. And if you're in group one, you were bottom of the class for all these different metrics, all these different health outcomes. OK, so you, were the, you had the worst physical activity. You smoked, you had really high blood pressure. Nobody wants to be in group one. Conversely, all the people in group six were the healthiest, top of the class for all these things. All right. So remember, you want to be in group six. So let's take a look at what happens in the future when they became adults. And what these researchers did is they looked at how thick the artery in the neck, the carotid artery is. That sounds a bit strange, but this is one of the most powerful biomarkers we have for predicting cardiovascular disease, such as strokes and heart attacks. It's an outcome we really value. It's clinically relevant. It's well established. And the thicker this artery is, the worse it is. OK. So let's have a look. Remember, you wanted to be in group six, not in group one. So 21 years after we measured them at children, this is their health status when they were a child. And this is how thick the artery is when they're an adult. OK, and you can see that if you're in group six, you've got a slightly thinner artery compared to group one. And remember, the higher up in this axis you go, the worse it is. You don't want to be in group one. 
So we're seeing profound differences. How profound? Let's, well, let's put this into some context. What does this difference actually mean? It equates to about 12 years of aging. So let's, let's use an example. Let's say I was 14 in this study and I had these metrics measured. And then 21 years later, uh, I was 35 and I had my artery scanned. I think I'm 35, but actually on the inside, I'm 47. I'm close to 50 years old. I've lost an eighth of my life. That process of cardiovascular disease is happening inside you. You don't necessarily see it in the mirror. Obesity is only one of several risk factors. Some of you should be nervously thinking about how you lived when you were a child uh, on the back of this evidence. Okay. So why physical activity then? Well, why is physical activity so important? It's because it, it influences favorably lots of these things, cholesterol, blood pressure, insulin resistance, blood glucose levels, overweight and obesity. In adults, it can even help stop smoking. So physical activity is like a, it really provides a benefit to lots of these risk factors. So let's take a look. But before we do, how many minutes of daily activity should children and adolescents be doing? I'll give you 10 seconds to answer a question in your head. If you have given me this answer, 60 minutes, that is the wrong answer. It's the best wrong answer you could give me. The guidelines are 60 minutes of exercise every single day, minimum. Minimum, I can't stress that enough. It's at least 60 minutes. That's profoundly different to saying 60 minutes. It's at least 60 minutes. Let's take a look in the UK of how many people achieve this. So this is the latest government data that we have. Um, quantifying physical activity can be slightly difficult. Um, so there are numbers that are certainly presented that are far, far lower than this, but I thought I'd be generous. And we can see that actually only 47% of kids in the UK achieve the recommended minimum amount of daily exercise. They are in the minority. They are a minority group if they are achieving the recommended amount, uh, recommended minimum amount of exercise. Okay, I just want to focus on this for a little bit. We're, we're trying to understand this 60 minute value. So I thought I'd show this with some data. This is data based in, in Europe. On our Y axis here, we've got the chance of having two or more risk factors, which we've covered already, okay? And here, and this study was in like 1,500 people. Um, if you're in group number five, they've split these, these children and teenagers into quintiles of physical activity, so fifths of physical activity. If you're quintile number five, you're in the top fifth, the top 20% of the class for physical activity. And they said, okay, we're gonna compare everyone to the most active kids. So these guys, we're gonna call them one, and we're gonna compare everybody to this group right here. If you're the least active, you're in the bottom 20% of the class, you'll be in group one down here, all right? And if you hit this value on the y-axis two, that means you're two times at risk of having these risk factors, okay? So the higher you go up on this y-axis, the worse it is. It's a bit of a strange scale, but hopefully I explain that, okay? And what you see is the least active are three, maybe three and a half times more likely to have two or more of these risk factors than the most active. That's pretty intuitive. We know physical activity is good. That should be a surprise to nobody. But remember, we've already covered this, the number of risk factors you have in use predicts the amount of fatty streaks you have in your blood vessels around your heart. And we know it might predict future health. Where this data gets really important and the point I'm really trying to make is look at look what happens when we actually say, okay, well, just how much exercise are these guys doing in each of the quintiles? That is the amount of minutes per day each quintile was doing for physical activity. So the most active 20% were doing 131 minutes of physical activity every single day. Look where you are if you're doing your 60 minutes. You are still three times the risk of having cardiovascular disease risk factors. It is the recommended minimum. And most kids in the UK aren't doing it. Okay, so what roles does school play? And I'm gonna finish on this, on this point here. When we go into schools to try and increase physical activity, physical activity, it's very, very hard to do. A systematic review and meta-analysis performed in 2012, and again in 2017, that pulled all the best evidence we have to try and increase physical activity, 
so that we can actually only increase physical activity per, uh, in minutes per day by just four or two. We are not good at increasing physical activity in the school environment. And that's because actually kids are most active when they're at school. It's when they go home that's the problem. So I'm going to leave that there and I want to talk about that you know, in Q&A and we're going to be picking up this theme next week with Becky Chilton's work um, about why, what can we do to actually make kids more attracted to physical activity in the school environment. But I'm also really interested in what happens in the home environment and how we get the parents involved. Okay, that's, that's all that we've got time for, but um, please do put your questions into the chat and I'd be delighted to, to get back to you. Thanks so much, Bert. That was excellent. Real uh, thorough understanding of why it's such an important topic um, and why we should be so aware. So I'll hand over to Alex now. Um, hopefully, Alex, you'll be able to put your slides up and present. Hopefully so. Yep. Okay. I'll just pop it on. Great. Is that okay, yeah, uh, Hannah? Yep. Okay. Thanks. Wonderful. Thank you for that, Bert. It's a tough act to follow some some really interesting yet very worrying statistics there. That was that was wonderful. Um, and thank you to Matthew and to Hannah and and, and Ollie and the and the wider Governors for Schools team for inviting me today. Um, lovely to be here uh, to offer my reflections, if you like, on the current PE and sport landscape and highlight what changes are in fact needed in order for schools to prioritise the physical health and well-being of pupils and staff. Uh, my background is in primary. We work with, as a foundation, um, many primary schools, also secondaries as well. So although parts of this might be with a bit of a primary focus, there are some, some transferable things to take away for, for secondary governors too. But one of the questions I was asked to consider was why some schools may go down the wrong path uh, in relation to P and sport. But uh, in answering that question, there's obviously a real risk of, of painting a bit of a negative picture. Um, and so I just wanted to add the caveat that although, yes, there are clear improvements to be made, both at national level and within individual school level, there really are some fantastic schools across the country who are really placing PE, school sport and physical activity, I'll refer to that as PESPA from now on, at the heart of school life and demonstrating outstanding practice. So our focus has to be on celebrating these schools, so governing bodies, senior leaders nationwide, then can't ignore the message that active children learn better and active happy teachers teach better. So the answer to why all schools are not currently placing peaceful sport physical activity at the heart is multifaceted. Um, and in the interest of time, I'd like to focus on one in particular that I believe is a key one. And that is that too many schools continue to ignore PESPA as a catalyst for whole school improvement. So for too long, PESPA has often been siloed by schools, They've very much been separated from wider school priorities, and it's often taught in isolation away from those wider priorities of the school. So we need to try to strengthen that message around the holistic benefits of PESPA for pupils and staff, and try to shine a light on the overwhelming evidence, some of which Bert's already gone into, and I'm sure John will too, that shows how physical activity can improve children's academic achievement, their behaviour, attendance, social skills, and mental health too. So this message underpins all of our work uh, with schools here in, in Yorkshire Sport, and, and I'll touch on the end a specific tool that we are using with schools to carry out this work. So how do we know that there's a disconnect between whole school improvement and PESPA? Well, schools are telling us. So at primary level, we know that since 2013, schools have been given the P and Sport premium funding. In that time, schools have actually received over £100,000. And yet in a DfE report just last year that analyzes how this money is being spent, schools continue to communicate alarming messages around a lack of sustainability around the funding. Um, that there's little understanding of how physical activity can impact on attainment. And still other subjects are being prioritized. But, but most worryingly, you can see in the top corner there, is despite a specific KPI of the grant, one in two schools are still saying that the funding has had little or no impact on improving the relationship between PESPA and whole school improvement. And insight from our networks tells us that this disconnect is also prevalent within many secondary schools too. P departments are very much separate from the rest of the school. 
few connections are made with other academic subjects and opportunities for children to be active outside of their PE time are, are few and far between. So there's many factors as to why those that statistic of one in two schools remaining so high, but fundamentally it comes down to the fact that on a larger scale at national level, despite recent improvements with the new education inspection framework, um, that we're still not seeing enough alignment between health policy and education policy. And simply put, this is influencing schools to prioritize academic achievement results over health and well-being, rather than focusing on the very clear evidence that health and well-being can actually be a driver for improved academic achievement. So another statistic taken from the same report um, that I'd like to highlight, um, as you can see there, tells us that, that only 41% of schools are actually leaning on governors when planning, monitoring and evaluating PE and sport premium expenditure. Now, to put it bluntly, you might think, well, that 41%, well, that's, that's quite high. It's not. That figure needs to be 100%. Within every school, there needs to be a strong collaborative relationship between the PE lead, the head teacher, the wider PE or health and wellbeing team, and a specific governor who helps to coordinate that fund and ensure PESPA is high on the whole school agenda. And governors play a crucial role in establishing that accountability for effective spend. And they also have the influence to go further than this and start to advocate for a culture at the school that promotes and delivers high quality PESPA opportunities. So after today, you might want to reflect on these questions. How often in a school year is PESPA discussed at governor meetings? Do you or other governors know the impact that the money at primary level is having on the school and well-being of pupils and staff? At secondary level, do you know the impact that the in sport is having across the school? Could this be something that you actually look to try to take ownership of if there is a little bit of a gap there on reflection? Now, there are, of course, many schools demonstrating outstanding practice when it comes to PE school sport physical activity. And again, in the interest of time, I've not been able to kind of go through them all, but I wanted to focus on one way which can really look to elevate. PESPA in a school and give it the profile it deserves alongside the core subjects, for example. So this is obviously a real area for improvement for schools as shown by the, the previous slides. So this won't be the first time you've seen this graphics. Of course, it's the four areas of judgment that schools, that schools receive. Now, it's natural with our kind of PESPA hats on to be drawn to the personal development um, judgment because we know PE has a huge role to play in that area and develop children. Uh, uh, excuse me, uh, holistically. But, but I'd also argue that PE and physical activity can impact positively on every aspect of those judgments. And schools that are demonstrating outstanding practice in PESPA have taken the time to explore that notion. And they're asking themselves the types of questions that you could see there under each judgment in the context with PE, the sport and physical activity. Just like they, just like they would for the maths curriculum, just like they would for the English curriculum. So perhaps another takeaway could be to consider how as a governor you could start, if these conversations haven't occurred, how you could start a conversation around the whole school impact of PE, support SLT and the PE lead to consider, well, what do these four areas of judgment truly mean for PESPA in your school? We know the research tells us active pupils are happier and more confident than less active pupils. The next, this slide and the next one is uh, a little bit of data from the secondary teacher training program, Sport England funded. So there are a number of secondary schools across the country receiving this teacher training program, upskilling senior leaders and PE leads on the, on the benefits of physical activity, PE and how it can be delivered. And that was a bit of, bit of feedback from that program. So we know pupils are happier and more confident than less active pupils. We also know, and teachers are voicing this, that physical, uh, that physical activity impacts positively on pupil behavior and attainment. This is secondary teacher feedback around those benefits. But even more significantly, and Bert touched on it a little bit earlier, we also know that children's physical activity levels have taken a huge hit as a result of COVID. I mean, the activity levels before were pretty bleak, but the pandemic has, has, has brought that 47%, 46.8% that, that Bert mentioned there, right down to 19% in the past year. 
That is a staggering level of inactivity across the country. So all this data and the research presents us with an opportunity. We've got to try to change the system because it's not working. We're failing quite bluntly. The education system is failing children when it comes to their health and well-being. So now's the time to use this evidence, all this disruption as a catalyst for change and embed PESPA at the heart of schools, investing in it safely in the short term, but sustainably in the long term. Now, how do we do that? So this is just to just just to finish. Well, what we need to do is work with individual schools. We know there's a, a disalignment in terms of national policy, health and health, health and well-being policy, educational policy. We know that. So we've, we've, we've got to obviously lobby for that change as well, but we've also got to work with individual schools and encourage them to adopt a whole school approach to physical activity. And the graphic you can see here is the Creating Active Schools framework. This is a framework that was uh, created right here in Yorkshire by ourselves at Yorkshire Sport Foundation, but in partnership with Dr. Andy Daly-Smith over now at Bradford University and Public Health too. And it's supporting schools to do precisely this, put physical activity at the heart of schools. And by September 21, across Yorkshire alone, there's going to be upwards of 100 schools implementing this framework. Um, there are already 12 other active partnerships across the country like ourselves who are looking to work with the framework and targeting um, certain schools to work with. So it was originally co-designed for primary schools, although now we're starting to work with secondary schools too. Um, to try to gather some learning of how this framework might actually look within a secondary school environment, because there are things that can be transferred. But essentially, the framework, the approach moves away from an intervention based approach, which has proven to be unsustainable in the past. And instead, it focuses on creating whole school behavior change around physical activity. So whereas before a PE lead might take an intervention into a school and say, I'd like to, I'd like to do this, please, with the staff. They might give them some resource to do that. The staff might actually carry out this activity and the physical activity intervention might take place for a number of weeks or even months. But eventually, in many cases, it dies a death. And the reason for that is because schools haven't addressed whole school practice and ethos. So fundamentally, the CAS framework starts, I'm not sure if you can see my kind of cursor, um, within that purple area there. So it starts with whole school practice at its center, and we get schools to really understand within whole, um, really understand within their mission or value statements and, and talk about where they want their children to be when they leave school and what is the provision given to enable them to become those individuals. So that ethos then drives the school policy and vision as it does with everything. So um, is physical activity and its benefits embedded within whole school improvement plans? Is it embedded within curriculum policy, maths, English, etc., and curriculum strategies? Are references made to the impact physical activity can have on behavior of pupils or their attendance records? Then underneath that, we have all the stakeholders, all the people within a school that operate within a physical environment and the social environment. So we, we encourage schools to take a look at their physical environment. It's getting schools to reflect on and understand the quality of that environment that they have and how that impacts on the physical activity levels of their pupils. So we're asking ourselves, how are classrooms set up? Is space utilized in a way that is conducive to movement? And these can go for primary or secondary. Are outdoor areas, playgrounds, green spaces, do they encourage school, um, and we encourage schools to look at their physical assets, the existing ones, and how they can mobilize them to create that space that then enables staff and motivates them to take children beyond the classroom to learn. And on the opposite side of that, we've got the social environment, which is a key one. So a few examples of the social environment might be, if you are a pioneering teacher who's delivering physical active learning, either in the classroom or outside, what are the other teachers and senior leaders saying about this? Is the response, oh great, you know, look how engaged the kids are. Uh, I must ask that teacher to share her idea with me. Or is it, oh, there goes that teacher again, making loads of noise and it's chaos with her class. So are teachers given the freedom to support and facilitate movement in lessons across the curriculum? To the point where if a learning walk or a lesson observation was to take place, would the teacher be confident enough to actually deliver an active task? Very nearly finished now. 
What the considerations are is physical activity and its impact um, talked about in governor meetings, in staff meetings. Is good practice shared consistently? Are teachers encouraged to, uh, by senior leaders to promote physical activity, talk about it to parents, to teachers, to governors, to pupils? There is then the role of the stakeholders within the school and getting to understand that everybody has a role to play in creating an active school. Physical activity is everybody's business. Just like safeguarding, we have a safeguarding policy. Staff are trained on its procedures. It's at the center of everything that schools do. Why should physical activity be different? You've just heard from Bert. Why can we ignore and should we ignore that? Obesity levels are high and evidence is there that increasing children's physical activity levels needs to be a collective effort. So if all of these aspects I've mentioned are in place up here in level one and level two of the framework, these opportunities that you can see at the bottom they will go from short-term interventions to long-term sustainable solutions due to the work that's been prioritized above it. So we'll link to more information on the impact on this framework um, it's having within schools. We'll be provided in the follow-up information um, and my contact details there. Um, and that's it from me, Hannah, thank you. Thank, thanks, Alex. <clears throat> Sorry, thanks, Alex, that's great. Um, should we move straight on to John? Uh, and then hopefully we'll have time for some questions at the end. Uh, over to you, John. Are you okay? You're on mute, John. I think. I think you're you're still on mute, John, at the moment. Can you just unmute yourself? Just while John's sorting yeah. out, I just want to let you know. It, it, it said the organiser had muted me, Hannah. Uh, so, okay, sorry about that. Uh, oh, it's okay, we're back on, okay. So okay, if you I, can see your desktop, but not your slides. Okay, can you see my That's slides right. now? Perfect, over okay. to you. Okay. Perfect, okay, thank you, Hannah. And, um, you know, one of the things, it's, it's, it's great for me to be here uh, this afternoon, and thank you for inviting me along, and it's great to hear off, off Bert and Alex as well. And, I think some of the things that they talk about, you know, I'm really passionate about. And I'll try, you know, I think everything that they've said I would concur with. And I'll just probably try and add my um, my slant and my view on things as well. So my name's John Smedley and I, I'm the founder of, of a company called Teach Active. But my background is very much, I've taught primary and secondary, but very much uh, predominantly primary school. I was a PE advisor for local authority, hence my love of getting children up and active and my real passion for physical activity within the school day um, and then I went back into school and I was a deputy head and therefore of course um, looking at driving up standards in English and maths. Um, I think one of the things just to pick up on something that Alex said one of the things I work with lots of schools all over the UK and I always ask them you know what is on your school development plan what are your priorities and the the answers always come back are reading writing and maths and uh, and for, for the points Alex pointed out, you know, there are the things that perhaps schools um, get forced to look at more. And, and I often ask that question of should physical activity, you know, be on your school development plan? And certainly it's something that I believe should be because it can drive up standards across the whole school as already has been alluded to. One of the questions I asked more recently to uh, many schools was, because of COVID, what, what are the things that you're really worried about now? And the top three things that came out, well, the first thing was uh, actually we're really worried about gaps in attainment. And of course, you can imagine that. There's a lot of children who have missed a lot of school. And of children who have returned to school, we're seeing, have they got those gaps? Have they fallen behind? Where do we need to really try and target some support? And you can imagine that teachers, head teachers, and, and of course, governors will be worried about that. The second thing, interestingly enough, was uh, they were recognising the importance of how worried they were about the lack of activity. And I think, you know, it's been a turbulent 12 months. I think the uh, one of the positives that have come out of it is that perhaps we've some schools uh, have realised now actually how important it is. Children have been very sedentary, of course, um, they've been at home, but of course things, you know, like leisure centres have closed, football clubs have different sports clubs have all been cancelled and therefore that was a real worry for schools and the third thing um, and these are in no particular order but the third thing that teachers and head teachers told us 
was that they were worried about children's emotional and mental well-being as well. Um, so it's positive to see that the government are actually, because one thing that we were worried about was that as children returned to school, that the government would say, we just need to concentrate on reading, writing and maths. This is what we need to do. Where actually governments have recognised the power of physical activity and said that schools should prioritise it. Because those three things, those three areas that all school leaders and teachers said that they were most worried about, well, actually, physical activity can impact on all three of them. It can impact on, of course, levels of physical activity. It can impact on educational attainment, and we know that. But it can also impact on social and emotional mental well-being as well, which I will come on to a little bit more. So, and again, as, as Alex mentioned, there are, and I would like to reiterate, there are some fantastic schools doing some fantastic things across this country um, and, you know, creating great opportunities for children. And I will often say to schools, what are you doing? What are you doing and, and to create that physical activity and the opportunities? And we'll have things from the doing, of course, PE, they're doing after school clubs, they're linking to local clubs, they're doing things like wake up and shake up, if you've heard of things like that, and blasts of activity, and perhaps stopping um, at lessons and doing a blast of activity before going back to learning. But the part that I'm really interested about is, is physically active learning. And this is where actually, rather than asking teachers to do more, 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 because that's where it can be problematic. I love all of those things. You've probably heard of the initiatives of Daily Mile, where all children go out and run, and, but those other things that I've mentioned, I love them all and I think they're great. But teachers are so busy that sometimes when we're asking them to do more, 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 those are the things that then disappear first when the week becomes unmanageable and when um, you know there's so many things to teach already. So what I say to schools and teachers is rather than doing more, all I want you to do is to do exactly what you're already doing, which is teaching your English and your maths lessons, but introduce some movement. And why are we sat down? Why are we at a chair? Why are we at a table for all of our maths and English lessons? Of course, sometimes we have to be, but sometimes we can incorporate movement. We don't need to be sedentary. We don't need to be sat down, as some reports would show, with 70% of the school day sat on a chair. We can get up and about. And sometimes that's just non-sedentary behaviour. It's bums off seats, it's moving around the classroom. And of course, other times it can be more vigorous activity and going down to the hall, the sports hall, or, or taking the learning outside as well. And why would we want to do that? Well, first of all, um, there's so much, you know, as, as Bert already is, is alluded to as well, the, the, the problems with physical activity, but there's so much um, data now and um, that shows us that link between physical activity and, and cognitive ability as well. So actually, it could improve. We're not taking away from learning, we're just adding it in. But one of the questions I was asked to consider and to tell people is, well, actually, John, what is active learning? What do you mean by active learning? Um, and this is why I will just talk a little bit about some of the uh, activities. So this is a year two game. So for those primary school governors, for secondary school, I'll show you some more relevant to you. But with maybe some year two children, if I was teaching them about understanding time, you'll see here this is the area of maths in the top left. We've got the objective that we've got to teach children. Well, how would we normally do that? And we can do all of that fantastic work. But then what we can also do is give some children some analog clocks, some give some children some digital clocks. And then what we can do is link those together and actually children can find their partner. If we were doing it as a targeted support, again, we can run and collect different things. If I was asking my, I used to teach my year sixes, and I've got a lot of year seven um, children doing this at the moment as well. Now, if my children had to get ready for a SATS paper, um, I know that's a, a, not a great word to use, but actually, rather than doing um, these practice papers sat down, maybe I can put cards up around the school hall or around outside. And we turn into a sort of maths orienteering and we're solving problems and we're solving clues, but we're up and about. And then this also introduces wider benefits like social skills, like teamwork and resilience and determination and taking away that perhaps can sometimes perceived idea that maths can be quite a threatening subject and I'm making going to get it right or wrong. Let's make it fun and engaging for children. Now, I've got three and a half thousand of these plans, so I'm not going to talk you through them you all. 
we're writing, you know, can we teach areas of writing? Well, of course we can, we can play fun games, we can play activities. So I think one thing that people sometimes think is, is, is physically active learning? Is it outside, is it running around? Is it, it's not, we're still learning. And it's not necessarily just running around and the emphasis is still on the learning taking place in, the, in, in this case, the English and the maths lesson. Um, and of course, the, the, the resource which I um, founded and, and now delivering to schools is a primary school resource. There are special schools who use us, there are secondary schools. But for you, of course, I'm not here to tell you about the benefits of my products. I'm just giving you an idea of perhaps what do we mean by active learning. And simply, it's just adding movement into our lessons and just encouraging that we don't have to sit down. Okay, so by doing these, children are naturally going to be up and active. So therefore, we are going to... Um, create more movement and we're going to help children to achieve this uh, minimum of 60 minutes every day but also um, benefits our attitudes and attainment as well and i work with you know over a thousand schools over the uh, over the uk last year we delivered teacher training to over two and a half thousand different teachers and all i want them to say is that children will love this now, not all children might love PE, but all children do love being physically active and being up and about and working with their friends. And we can see that actually they're gonna have a smile on their face, a twinkle in their eye. And this is what we want. We want children to love learning and love English and maths. But you can see from this, just one case study that I've picked out here, and, and Chris joins us later. I know that his school does some fantastic work. But this school went from the national averages of maths results to the top 5% of maths results nationwide. They were part of a government parliamentary review. They've been uh, visited by BBC News recently. This school is one primary school of the year, and it also won the TES uh, Mental and Health Wellbeing School of the Year. And this is a video, but I'm afraid the sound's not working, but if you go onto our website, you'll be able to see this. But this gentleman is just, again, talking about how, why is his school head the school, primary school of the year? He talks about health at the heart of the curriculum, and why physical activity is so, so important to driving up standards across his school. So we're not losing out. We're not, some teachers might think, oh, we're active. Oh, great. Okay, the children are loving it. Great. But am I going to miss out on learning? Well, no, your children are going to retain the information better. They're going to recall that information, and it's going to help them to master all of these key skills as well. And actually, that's only going to support them. The benefit that I always talk with schools is, is, again, what we've touched on already today, but why is physical activity important? And I ask this to children, and children tell me it's about staying slim and fit and healthy. But then I say, well, do you know that it's going to help your concentration? Do you know that it's going to help your memory? It's going to make you more productive within the school day. Actually, you might have more energy. You might sleep better. You might have more confidence, self-esteem, social skills, teamwork. And this is why I came into teaching because I want to develop the whole child. I don't want to stamp an age-related expectation on their head. Of course, maths and English is important, but as Alex already said, and Bert suggested that actually physical activity can drive up standards across your whole school. And that's why it should be on your school development plan. I'm going to finish just by uh, mentioning, Matt, Matt asked me when invited me to talk to you a little bit about Teach Active. I wanted to talk to you about what I was passionate about, which was active learning. When I left my role as a deputy head six years ago, um, it was I had a file of ideas and I shared them and gave them to schools for free. And that's grown now into a, an online resource with three and a half thousand lesson plans. So if schools need support and help in introducing active maths and active English, they might be able to do it themselves. They might have great teachers who can do that and that's fantastic and, and that's all we need. If they need some support, and of course, Teach Active, there's free plans there for them to have a go at. Um, so I encourage your schools to have a look at. The benefits we've already mentioned. And of course, I've mentioned that we, we work with schools all over the UK. We work with schools internationally. And you know, it's making a huge difference. And hopefully more and more schools can come on board. And based on everything that you've heard here today, um, that will be the case. A big thank you from me. A big thank you for inviting me along, as we mentioned. I'll stay on for any Q&A at the end, um, and I uh, enjoyed working with you, so thank you.
Thanks so much, John. Excellent. And we are lucky to welcome Chris Tolson. Hi, Chris, you made it. Excellent, thank you. Uh, you're on mute at the moment. If you can just, I don't know whether Ollie's muted you as you did with John. Yeah, sorry, I was uh, organising lunch cover and a number okay. of other crazy things today, so Perfect. Um, sorry about that. Um, That's okay. Your screen is shared at the moment. Oh, is it? So if I put this yeah. up, is that, can you see that? There we are. Yeah, perfect. perfect. Right, sorry. So just going to sorry. sort this out. I'll be as quick as I can. <laughs> can you? So can you all see that? Perfect. Lovely. Thank Great. you. So, okay. um, Over to you, Chris. Can, I did an can introduction. Can you see the things that were Oh, there we go. I'll, I'll just sort of, that's better. Right, so, so hello everybody. Um, I'm Chris Tolson. I work at the Academy of St. James in Bradford. Um, I was asked to sort of talk today about our sort of ethos and approach to physical activity. You may have seen the BBC News report on Friday. Uh, it was on national news looking at P and Sports Premium and how that funding is spent and so on. And we were we were very lucky to be part of that um, that news report um, in terms of how we are using our current funding, but also much more holistically how we're trying to support our children to be physically active and and promote their well-being, which um, for me and for the school here is is a fundamental part of what we're trying to do. So I'm just going to going to run through um, our our approach really, if that's okay. Um, so sorry, can you see? Can you see just my slides or can you see the other screens on there? No, we can just see your slides. Oh, it's a bit weird because I can see your faces plus another box, so I keep thinking okay. I'm presenting that as well. We okay. can see you as well, but the presentation is... Yeah, is yeah. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to try and move it because I can't actually see what I'm presenting then. <laughs> so, there we go. That's better. Right. So, um, I must credit Niall O'Brien with some of these slides, a lot of these slides as well, because he, he's done some presentations for us and Niall works as our sort of key sports lead uh, and leader in school. So. Um, oh dear, how do I just try to move the slide along? Don't know how I do that. Now I just prick, click enter. Uh, ah, there we go. So, so, so physical activity, outdoor learning, physical education, play, pal, school sport. I suppose why all the fuss was was Niall's comment, and I think we we were in special measures in 2017 in in January. I started here was a fourth head in nine months. Um, we had a whole number of temporary exclusions, um, over over 100. Um, Behaviour was was really difficult. Um, school was in a really bad situation. I started in the January um, and we've sort of progressed our, our offer over the, over a four year period. And sort of 18 months ago, we we had to really rethink about what well, that's probably more than two years ago now, actually, about our approach to to this. To this. Um, so this is this is us. This is um, uh, us as a school and where we're based and what we are looking at. Um, and I think that those are quite interesting factors for, for for the audience to look at in terms of where we are and, and what we've done because we're in Thornton, Ollerton. We, you know, top 10% of most of our neighbourhoods in the country and in our area. And that's what Born in Bradford shows us. And we know the facts around the, the jump programme that we're very lucky to be part of that support us with our work. Um, so immediate challenges. This was uh, some of the, the, the sort of factors that we've been looking at during the pandemic, which has caused, you know, it's been interesting for us. We took the opposite approach. So we actually, during the pandemic, did double the amount of physical activity in PE that that we would normally do. Um, so we had a, a well-being Wednesday and a well-being Friday. So there was no screens in the afternoons. We did completely um, all about well-being and physical activity. Um, so we doubled the amount that the children were getting who were in school, and we also tried to promote that at home as well. Um, so what what does our provision look like? Um, it looks like this. Um, I'm going to come on to show you some sort of images and pictures of that later. Um, I would also say as well, I'm happy to say this, as a head teacher, my perception and, and sort of view and vision for um, PESPA has completely changed. You know, so what I thought three years ago is not what I think now. And I think as leaders, we have to be brave and, and say, well, it's OK to keep learning, isn't it? It's OK to change our minds and work with great people like Niall and uh, Alex is on here and came to visit the school the other week. You know, it's all about learning and getting, trying to get better, a little bit better every day. Um, and you know we're not the finished article. We we recognise that there are things we need to work on, 
but we also know that we've taken really difficult decisions, but brave decisions about what we feel our children need um, and why it's important. And our combined has gone from 27% to 63% in three, two, in two and a half years. Uh, they took lockdown out of it. So we know it's working. Um, we know that the pupils um, are happier, concentrate more, the behaviour has been transformed. That was the phrase that Ofsted used when they came back here in 2019. So we know that it's working. Um, so we're now in a sort of a fine tuning element. However, I would also say that our sort of play offer, our active enrichment offer, which I'll come on to, and our learning offer has significantly improved in the last 18 months. Um, there's several reasons for that. Number one was Niall, who's working with us. I, this is my school development plan. It's, I wanted that for the schools. I identified some of that I needed to, because I, I could see it coming, really. I think with all the this high accountability framework that we exist in, you know, pupils are having more and more pressure on them to, to achieve high standards. And actually, I thought, well, we need to think outside the box a little bit and support them and our teachers to become um, sort of you know, more grounded, I guess, and really help them to, to think through difficult problems. Um, and also, I think through the pandemic, through what's been, as a head teacher, a, a crazy 18 months, um, we've tried to keep this at the centre of what we're doing. So for us, this is about learning outdoors. We have, um, so in total, eight forest school sessions a week, so this is the two or an hour and a half. Here are some of the things that we, we use um, and we invest really heavily in forest school. We just built a um, outdoor classroom, which has been built by a parent. We've also created a, a den building area and a fire pit down the bottom of our field. And that'll be, be good. that's going to be opened by Dr. Amir Khan actually in, in about a month's time who did all the LFT testing stuff. So uh, he's he's working through the Nature Friendly Schools program that we've been been part of. Um, so there's some facts about connecting to nature. You, you know, last I think it was last week in National Mental Health National Mental Health Week, it was all about spending time with nature. Here's some quite startling stats, and you, you probably know this already, but about why it's important for children to spend time outside. Uh, and we've, we've our, our whole nurture program is focused on this now, um, and we we make sure that our children, and particularly specific children, get that time that they need to spend time close to nature. I'll just leave that there for you to have a think for a second. I would argue that our children have actually spent more time outside. Um, you know, we we actually did, as I said before, we doubled the amount of time that we spent outside. So, which is a, a sort of our, our outdoor learning commitment. So, Nature Friendly Schools partner, um, we four per week, six hours. Um, if we if we look at that, actually, there's there's more than that happens because we look at our Friday afternoon session, which I'll come on to. We have worked with um, local areas of beauty, so Pity Bet Wetlands, Bingley St Ives, Ogden Reservoir, and Cello Dean. Uh, we've invested in, in, in a minibus so we can take our children out to those places. We take the whole school to Nellbank, so we take over a four day period, we take everyone from nursery to reception uh, and we're going to Ingleborough and Nellbank in the next month. We also do a whole school trip, that's everybody to Filey. Uh, obviously we couldn't do it this year or last year, but that's what we've done for, for two years previous. We, you know, we have eight coaches all lined up at the top road. We take the entire school, everybody walks out the building and we go to Filey for the day. So, you know, for us, it's about really, really important pledge. Um, funny story, actually, when we went to Filey, um, we, were, we were just pulling out of the, the, the main road and we were, we were in the Telegraph and Argus because we were apparently blocking the road before we, uh, to admit as our bus couldn't get past. So you would have hoped that they, they would have reported that we were happy to take all our children to the beach, but oh no. They wanted to report that we were blocking a, a road, so the, the, it was a bus route, apparently. That was nice. Um, dedicated space to enjoy risk play. We've invested heavily in the Loose Parts play area, uh, which Mr O'Brien sourced uh, and done a great job with that. So our children get access to Loose Parts play at lunch, playtime, at lunchtime, and specific um, classes go out there on a regular basis. So our early years, right from two-year-olds to... Um, uh, reception or have a session out there every week, which is really, really important. And we've also engaged parent volunteers. We've had a parent volunteer build our outdoor classroom with a bird hide hatch, uh, which will be open in July. So why? Well, then about two years ago, I was starting a meeting about the Creative Access Schools framework, and we wanted to look at changing behaviours through a whole school approach. This was pre 
and uh, Niall working with us actually, but I went there and thought I need to really think differently about. We got to a certain place in the school and we did really, really well. Um, but in the back of my mind as a leader, I needed to sort of rethink and recalibrate um, what was going to happen next. And this um, meeting that I took part in really helped me focus on those key areas. So if you look at our whole school practice and ethos, um, that building into school leaders, how to in engage children, parents, the wider community in all those areas. So for us, for example, our breaks and lunches, we really rethought that and thought, what can we do to keep our children more active um, during those times? Um, and I'm happy to answer some questions on that afterwards. So we had to implement a policy to make sure that we everyone was understood what it was. Um, and I'll give you an example of that. On a Friday afternoon, um, we have something called Flashback Friday. So from 1.15 to 1.45, the whole school basically reviews their learning for that week. Uh, why? We're working with the research school and we recognise that children cannot just be filled with knowledge time and time and time again, because eventually they're going to be full. So on Friday afternoons, we have a flashbacks, we go over our learning, and then for a whole hour, we spend it outside doing a range of activities. Uh, which we call our Active Enrichment Hour. Um, so it covers a whole range of things from archery, climbing, photography, um, visiting the local nature reserve, to bikes, scooters, which we bought during lockdown, um, to loose parts play. Uh, we've got a bike track. So we built all those things and people have bought into that because they recognise it's important, not just for them. Our teachers you know, are leaving school a little bit fresher because they've had a chance to sort of connect with the children on a Friday. The children are really happy because they're leaving having had an excellent session outside. There's lots of learning going on out there. So if you think about archery or you think about photography and, you know, there's lots and lots of learning going on there that isn't just physical activity. It's a whole holistic approach. Um, and we've also, um, I've managed to, to link it into my appraisal and into the way that we run our um, school development program. So actually it's in there, you know, um, if you were to look at my school development plan, it would be in the third section um, and it's in there and exactly what we're gonna do and how we're gonna do it. And obviously we are pretty relentless in our approach to that through Twitter and, and Dojo. So if any of you follow us, you will, <laughs> you will probably know that we, uh, we send quite a lot out. Um, I, and I, I wanted to clarify that actually, because as a school, when I started here, um, there, was a, there was a really difficult perception the school was not very good. I won't send my children there. It's it's really difficult. The behaviour is really poor. So I spent a good two years trying to change the perception of the school through social media. Um, now, yes, we did do a revamp of the whole curriculum and the uniform and everything else. But I also want to send positive messages about what we're doing. Um, and it isn't it's not about saying we're better than somebody else because I don't think we are. It's not about saying that um what we do here is is you know is this it's about saying at our school we're really proud of what we do and the children are really happy they're enjoying themselves they're doing well and we're celebrating it so we can get those positive messages out to our community and wider and also we're sharing you know we 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 borrow i borrow things from other people all the time from there and i would hope that they would borrow from us and, that, and that's absolutely okay that's what the that's what twitter should be for so we also have been engaging with um Leeds Beckett University with Year 3-4, investigating the effects of active learning and movement breaks and attention. We've done two sessions of that, so we're waiting for the feedback, and then we're going to be Im implementing active breaks into lessons from September based on the research that they've done. Uh, we do have some examples of that already, but actually through this research, um, and we as a school have really invested in a lot of research, so we work with the Bradford Research School around memory retrieval and how pupils can remember things um, the Ebbinghauser forgetting curve, for example, is all about if you need to remember something after day one, day three and day six. And if you don't come back to that learning regularly, they're just going to forget it. Um, and actually, the parallels are interesting, aren't they, through, through PESPA, actually. It's really interesting how we get into habitual ways of, of, of working. I, I broke my ribs three weeks ago. I broke a rib. You know, I haven't done any exercise since. Um, and actually, I don't feel good. <laughs> um, but actually, I probably could now, but I mean, I'm in that sort of lethargic state where I, I actually I probably could start doing it, but I've got into a habit of not. And that made me think about the habits that we need to embed in our children uh, regularly. Um, so, Chris, we celebrate. Can, I, can I just stop? Yeah, we've only got one more minute left and I know we've got questions. 
Sorry. So all of your slides will be shared um, via, yep. the, um, via the power no of email afterwards. Um, yep. But we have got a couple of questions. So just wanted to, to have time to put those to the panellists, if that's okay. I think we only had a couple of slides left. Yeah, right? Yeah, no worries. Sorry about Sorry, that. Thanks. No, no problem. Thank you so much. Um, so quick by a 15 second answer from each speaker, really. Um, what would be your message to schools and boards who feel they don't have the time or resources to give focus to physical activity? So can I go to Bert first? Is that OK? Um, sure. I think I'd probably pick up on what Chris and, and John were both saying. Try and make it habitual, try and make it routine, try and embed it in the curriculum. And don't think of adding physical activity in at the expense of anything else. I would just like to add, as well as increasing physical activity is important, decreasing continuous sitting time is also important. So that's something else we can consider in the same bracket. Sure, thank you. John, you're above, above Bert on my screen. Would you like to go next? Um, yeah, I, I, would, I just uh, point schools to schools where it's working. Like Chris is, for example, like some of the others I referred to, to say, actually look at the, the story and look at the difference it's having there. And you know, we know that schools listen to other schools and heads and listen to other heads. It's that's what we should do. And and if it works in one school, why won't it work in others? So uh, show them someone who's on their level and, and say, yeah, it does work. Thank you, Alex. Yeah. So uh, apart from setting up a virtual call with Chris and that head teacher and SLC <laughs> team, apart from that, um, I would say it's about working smarter and not harder. Um, EJ Fogg from Stanford University has written a brilliant book called Tiny Habits and he says um, if we want our habit to become real behaviour change we need to find the real estate in our day and attach the behaviour to it. Same applies for schools. Find that real estate within a school, whether it's um, within a lesson like, or lining up, register time, on time routine, find that real estate, attach a bit of physical activity to it and it becomes very natural and automatic. Thanks Alex and Chris to finish this off. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. So I think for me, I think it's it's really about um, having that whole school approach. So getting buy-in from everybody and sharing your ethos with many, many different partners. Um, mm -hmm. Our parents, our pupils, our staff, our wider partners who we work with. Just understanding that it's very important. So our governors, we we work with them. We've shared three presentations with them in the last year about this. So they are very much they understand. So if they understand, they'll back it. Um, you know, and actually they, they can see that we're spending our sports print money very well. Um, but actually the impact is also there as well. So we're not we're not making this up. You know, it is actually working. And for our for our governors, they have to their job is to be a critical friend, isn't it? So to really analyze what I'm doing and why am I doing it. And that's what they're there for. So I have to be able to answer those questions. And I think if they get it, parents understand, children get it, teachers get it, you, you create like a really it, it, I, I, I'd say a vacuum, but I don't mean in that way. I mean in a really positive way that everyone's working towards the same goal, which is what we are trying to do at the moment. Excellent. Well, I think that's a really good way to finish up. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much to all of our panelists. It was great to have you on board. We may well Sorry, have I was some late. questions. No, no problem at all. We will probably have some questions to put to you afterwards, which we'll try and share with with the uh, attendees. Um, I would just say, the people um, on the Sport Premium Funding Fund, we do have a webinar on the 15th of June, um, which is going to look specifically at how to best spend and make sure that governors are tracking spend on, on Sport Premium. So that'll be another one, interesting one to dial into. But thank you ever so much to all of you. Really appreciate your time today. And um, thanks everybody who has been listening in um, to hear about this important subject. Thank you ever so much. Bye-bye. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Bye-bye.